It's great to be with you here today. My name is Daniel Franks and I'm a professor at the Sustainable Minerals Institute here at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. At the Sustainable Minerals Institute, our work is focused on developing knowledge solutions for the big sustainability challenges posed by the extraction and use of minerals. A major theme of the UNESCO lecture series on earth materials for a sustainable and thriving society uh, is that minerals matter in our efforts to achieve the ambitious sustainable development goals because they're literally the matter that underpins much of global development. In today's lecture, I will focus on the neglected minerals and materials in, of development. I will ask if we've been focused on the wrong commodities, the wrong actors, the wrong issues, and therefore the wrong development pathways. For earth scientists working on issues of development, it's quite common for us to start our presentations by saying that minerals are implicit to or embedded within each and every one of the 17 goals and 169 targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. And while I agree, and I often start my presentations in this way, we must also admit that it's just another way of saying that the SDGs were formulated without any reference whatsoever to minerals or earth materials. The publication of Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, followed a three-year process of consultation, summits and high-level political forums to define the post-2015 development agenda. The 15,000-word outcome report describes the SDGs and their constituent indicators and maps in detail how humanity can achieve the future we want. And while natural resources feature prominently, the report does not contain a single mention of the words mineral, mining or miner. Forests, fisheries, wildlife, pasture, energy, water and genetic resources, they're all mentioned, but minerals are not. Agriculture, water resource management, forest management, all described in careful detail, but mining is absent. Farmers, herders, pastoralists, fishers, all have a place, but miners do not. Target 2.3, for example, calls for a doubling of the incomes of small-scale farmers, pastoralists and fishers. There's no mention of the fate of the world's 100 million plus artisanal small-scale miners. Target 14B is to provide access for small-scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets. There's no equivalent target for miners. So how could this be? How could the international community emit earth materials, one of the classic elements of nature so key to human existence? Well, in 2013 and 2014, I was a member of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network thematic group on good governance of extractive resources. And our role was to advise on the formulation of the SDGs and the post-2015 development agenda. We prepared reports describing the fundamental role of minerals and, and their governance to sustainable development. And we formulated draft wording for the goals and targets that were inclusive of mining uh, for consideration by the various committees and panels crafting the agenda. One reason why I believe our arguments were not ultimately persuasive is that the stories we tell as a society about minerals, mining and miners, are told in just one dimension. They're stories about irresponsible big mining companies running roughshod over the environment and communities, and irresponsible artisanal small-scale miners fueling conflict, clearing forests and fouling rivers. Now these stories have merit. We can think of plenty of examples. But on the ledger that tallies the villains and heroes of our planet's twin crises of environmental sustainability and global poverty, minerals are almost always are marked the villain. Now this generates an enormous amount of stigma for the sector and the people within it, and makes it difficult for those imagining a sustainable world to create a place in this utopia for minerals, for mining and for miners. A second reason related to the first is that our framing of the mineral sector bears no resemblance at all to the actual mineral sector. Mostly when we think about mining, we conjure Im images of big machinery, global trade. We think about gold, iron ore, copper, perhaps coal and gemstones. We think of big multinationals like Rio Tinto, BHP um, and Vali. Or we think about small scale mining. We think about the men and women panning for gold or fossicking for diamonds in circumstances of poverty. It's little known that in fact, metals make up a minority of global commodities by production, volume and value. That the majority of mineral commodities are not exported. 
that large scale multinational mining companies are relatively minor players in the global mineral sector and that the vast majority of minerals and materials are mined hidden from view and barely noticed by society. The most important commodity as a function of volume and value is actually sand. Estimates of global sand, gravel and aggregate production are in the vicinity of 50 billion tonnes per year, which is a staggering 6.5 tonne per person per year, making it arguably the most utilised natural resource after water. Most of this aggregate is crushed stone, but sand represents around 10 to 13 billion tonne of material per year, with around 5 billion tonne sourced from rivers in the marine environment. To help visualise the scale of the sector, the total historic production of gold roughly fits into just three Olympic-sized swimming pools. The yearly production of sand, gravel and crushed stone would not fit into 10 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And it's not just sand. Eight of the top 10 produced commodities are industrial, non-metallic minerals or construction materials, which total 84% of global mineral production. Metals represent just 2.8%. Yet almost all of the research, policy making and development programming on the mining sector is about metals, energy minerals or precious stones. The framing of the mining industry in this way has major implications for global development. Millions of people are involved in the mining and quarrying of local industrial minerals like gypsum and salt and construction materials like sand, gravel, limestone and granite. Economic geologists call these commodities low value minerals and materials due to their low production their low price as a function of their weight and their relatively low value to international commodity markets. But from a development perspective, low value commodities are anything but low value. Their value is in their local and domestic use rather than the price that they might command on global markets and as inputs for domestic economic development and broad based national development. While working at UNDP, I and some colleagues started to refer to them as development minerals that is, minerals and materials that are mined, processed, manufactured and used domestically in industries such as construction, manufacturing, infrastructure and agriculture. Development minerals are economically important close to the location where the commodity is mined. In comparison to the metal sector, development minerals have closer links with the local economy with a more direct impact on poverty reduction. And because the sector is dominated by informal miners and small and medium scale domestic businesses, it provides a livelihood for millions of people, yet also suffers a series of environmental, social, health and safety and labour rights challenges. So to recap, development minerals are important because they make up a vast majority of global mineral production. They're important in all countries. They're local materials mined by local people for local development. They're a huge employer of youth and women. They have greater potential for poverty reduction and closer li links to the SDGs, and they're critical for structural transformation. I'll talk further in a moment about the economic aspects of development minerals, but before I do, let me introduce you to some people in the sector. Hi, my name is Sharmila, and this is my business. I do extracting of sand. The business name is Nathakala Dredging. Dagut Josephine. I'm an artisan, a money miner in Russia United a Mining Association. I am Michelle Shaw from Shaw Quarry. I am a licensed quarry operator in the Cane River Quarry Zone outside of Kingston, Jamaica. My name is Dusu Nabe. I'm an entrepreneur. As a construction company, we have to go to the quarries. We have to buy those minerals, development minerals like tan, stone. I'm doing this extraction for last 13 years. Right now, I'm thinking of expanding my business. My vision is to have a block plan and have nice good trucks to deliver customers and employ people. We do mining of gravel and coarse stones. Uh, these stones we are bought from the West Rock. We do all grades construction aggregates, we do materials for block making, we do boulders, we do materials to be used for wall packing, etc. My vision is uh, to grow, to help people grow too.
because when I grow, the people with me grow. Membership in our Busia United is 43. We have 20 women and we have 23 male. My dreams for this association, one of them is to see growth. Uh, we need actually to have the community grow, growth in the whole community uh, at large. Uh, I also have a dream of actually empowering the women. Just like uh, when you check in these sites, we are seeing the majority are the women who are actually suffering, scratching, doing the hard work to ensure the, the families survive. Because a lot of burden has been left to these women. All the time they are here from morning to sunset to ensure they fend for the families. Now, little do these women know that they have the power and potential in them. So if we sensitize them and they actually come to realize the, the power lies in their hands, they have the potential, uh, it's women who can actually change uh, our community. And then you borrow money from the bank, you get loan. When you get loan, it's a certain, like uh, you have to pay interest. And then you go, when you get loan, you go to those uh, quarries, buy the materials from there, and then pour the one who gave you the contract did not give you like uh, the money early and then the bank is taking interest where the interest rate is really high sometimes you it's like you lose we would definitely need business intelligence we would need information about the supply and demand we would need technical data and we would most definitely need um, better access to trade financing. Give us some small funding and we transform our communities. I'm so grateful. To help us think through the economic contribution of development minerals, let's first think about and discuss the development value of export minerals. So the International Council for Mining and Metals in 2012 uh, put out a, a policy brief on the role of mining in national economies. And uh, the way in which they think about the impact of the large-scale mining sector uh, on the economy is uh, in these five different areas. The most important, uh, from the perspective of the ICMM, uh, is the foreign direct investment uh, that comes from uh, the already developed world into uh, developing economies uh, to invest in large-scale mining projects. Um, in mining-focused economies, that can represent up to 60 to 90% of all foreign direct investment. Then, next, they point out the export value that can come from uh, exporting raw um, or minimally processed um, mineral commodities um, from the developing world to markets in the global north. Next on the list is uh, government revenue. Um, government revenue can be up to 20% uh, coming from the mineral sector for, for some economies. And then further down the list uh, they have national income and um, employment. Employment in the large-scale mining sector as a function of, of the economy is very low in many countries. Um, only between uh, one and two percent of total employment. If we're thinking about the development mineral sector in contrast, it's almost the opposite of uh, internally, internationally traded uh, export commodities. Um, foreign direct investment is not a large factor um, in uh, the development mineral sector. Um, most investments that are attracted in the sector are domestic investments. Again, in the same way, exports are obviously not a major part of um, development mineral commodities, um, which are defined by the fact that they're domestically uh, produced. Um, only a small proportion um, of uh, development minerals commodities exports. These tend to be um, niche exports. Government revenue mostly is in the form of secondary taxation. Um, in the most part, uh, it's an informal sector, so the government isn't bringing in large amount, large amount in direct taxation, but it does get a lot in um, f flow on in terms of consumption. So taxation uh, down, the, down the line because of the a large amount of people involved in the sector uh, and their consuming materials that are there, they're taxed. Next is domestic value addition. Now we're getting to the more important side of the development minerals value chain. Minerals feed local industries 
um, with upstream value addition taking place inside the country. So the commodities are actually contributing to um, value addition inside the country. And the most important by far is employment. Employment of very large numbers of low wage, relatively low skilled people um, with um, significant potential for upskilling. So to summarize, metals that are mined for export have relatively strong fiscal linkages, that is the royalties and taxation, average consumption linkages because they don't have a lot of employees in the sector that drive economic consumption, poor production linkages because most commodities are exported minimally processed, and poor utilisation linkages in that the commodity is not providing a service to the domestic economy. Development minerals, on the other hand, are mined and used domestically. They have low fiscal linkages, they don't generate a lot of direct taxation. Strong consumption linkages because there's so many employees in the sector all generating a, a wage that has been spent in the economy that is then driving economic development. Strong production linkages because most development minerals have transformation um, into other products within the economy, within the domestic economy and strong utilisation linkages, the service that that commodity provides is provided to the domestic economy. Now to get a better understanding of the impact of the sector to the economy but to also sustainable development more generally, the United Nations Development Program and its partners, the European Union and the African Caribbean and Pacific Group of States invested in a series of six baseline studies on development minerals. Uh, those studies were conducted in Uganda, Fiji, Jamaica, Zambia and Cameroon. And what they showed was that the size and impact of the sector is much larger than previously thought. In Uganda, 390,000 people are directly involved in the sector, 44% of those women. In Fiji, the sector is uh, 2,325 direct jobs. In Jamaica, 1,750. Zambia, 6,815. And Cameroon, are nearly 9,000 jobs. The studies also found that this economic contribution is not being picked up in official development statistics. Artisanal small scale mining of development minerals in Uganda is seven times the value of the official production of all minerals and 4.2 times the value of unofficial artisanal gold. If ASM of development minerals were integrated within the official statistics of Uganda, it, the GDP would increase by 1.4% with almost 7% of the population estimated to rely on artisanal small-scale mining of development minerals. In Fiji, the contribution of development minerals to Fiji's economy is undervalued, with underreported production from hard rock quarries estimated to be 100 million Fiji dollars. It's more than double the total contribution of the sector recorded in the latest GDP figures. In Jamaica, the total value of 2015 production of development minerals was nearly 7 billion uh, Jamaican dollars and quarrying contributed to 1.7 million dollars uh, to the government in 2015. In Zambia, uh, clay bricks made up nearly 50% of all housing units with fire bricks a further 26.5%. Uh, There's a huge deficit for housing units in Zambia uh, which can be filled by growth uh, of this sector. And in Cameroon, sand is the most extracted mineral commodity by artisanal miners, accounting for 56% of uh, artisanal mining and 58% of all mining sites. The African Union Commission has called on member states to prioritise development minerals as part of Africa's industrialisation agenda. In this next part of the presentation, I'll share how development minerals are linked with this industrialisation agenda and also with the African mining vision. African mining vision is about transformation of African economies. It's about structural and structural transformation. 
environment main roles uh, are now taking a lot of attention uh, in the Africa mining vision. And most of the time our member states have more paid attention to what is called high value minerals, forgetting that these minerals and this sector which is most likely neglected is actually creating more jobs, it's creating more wealth for people, but they are not supported to ensure that they are working in a proper environment. Also, they are protecting the environment, uh, health and safety issues for them. The member states have recognized, and especially the last concluded uh, special technical committee, that this is a very important sector. It can feed into the agenda for three, but also of the sustainable development. So these development minerals are really neglected ones. I can talk for Mozambique. Uh, we are always focusing on the large scale mining and we are not focusing much on the, on the, on the small scale artisanal uh, mining that exists. I mean, the numbers are there staggering, uh, but we are not really benefiting. So this was an eye opener for us uh, to see that what can be done, all the linkages forward, backward linkages, but all the other industrial minerals that, you know, can have uh, uh, can be used for industrialization. Uh, make sure that the government, but also all the other, the civil society and uh, the others are aware about this and make and and make it uh, take it forward. The issue is always working on how to get things done. The opportunity that exists is getting that body of work that exists within ASM to the ground level getting to implement what we are talking about, what has been spoken about for years on end. And I feel that implementation level is what exists as the opportunity for AMDC to be in touch uh, on the ground. We have spoken about ASM even before the AMV. Uh, there have been processes that talk about how it should be better, how communities can actually develop. This is very critical. Look at this. Two sites you have visited, there are almost over 500 people working in this and in very bad environment, they don't have associations, they are not represented, they are paid very low, they are mainly women, we have seen some kids working here. They all have, are not yet protected, they are not into the main stream of what the government protection. So in order to work and help these guys and to ensure that they feed into the economy of the country, we need to address these challenges. We need to work with the government to put laws, regulation, to ensure that they are actually included in the mining laws, to ensure that they have strategies that will help them and to recognize them. They, they, they need to have a government that is behind them to ensure that they become the actual proper African private sector. With UNDP Mozambique, uh, we have a program on extractive industries for sustainable development whose aim is also to implement the Africa mining vision at the country level. The Africa mining vision has a key pillar, a cluster of, on artisanal and small scale mining. That is one pillar that we need to take care of, the knowledge generation element of it, to say we have spoken about it, but how are we actually going to work on what we've discussed? But we don't want to look at them in, a, in, in, in isolation. We look at them in totality. We make sure that they understand the geology, the geological information supports them. They are, they, they, they are contributing to the linkages, industrialization. If you look at here, they are actually crushing. They are adding value to these aggregates to feed into the construction industry. So they are actually feeding into the industrialization, into linkages. What they need are within the Africa mining vision. That cluster calls on them being recognized being brought into the main uh, stream of vision of the country, of the sub-region like ECAS and eventually on the continental agenda. I started today's presentation by arguing that the SDGs and the development sector more generally has been neglecting some important development pathways. In this final section, I'll draw some of the links between development minerals and the SDGs and I'll highlight some areas deserving of greater attention. Development minerals respond to different drivers than export commodities. Demand is driven by the construction sector, by infrastructure, urbanisation, industrialisation, by increases in population, by the agriculture sector and natural disasters. And therefore, the way that development minerals link to the SDGs is also different. For example, in northern Cameroon, a group of internally displaced people, the majority of them women, have formed a cooperative to mine local material, clay bricks and dimension stones, to rebuild houses, clinics and schools as part of early recovery efforts following the conflict with Boko Haram. 
They're challenging traditional reconstruction approaches that truck in con concrete blocks, which are incompatible with the Sahel climate and less secure. In Fiji, after Cyclone Winston in 2016, the country suffered major shortages of construction materials, completely running out of cement, which it needed to import. A post-disaster needs assessment was conducted but overlooked the capacity of the quarry sector to provide the material necessary for the 80,000 destroyed and 32,000 partially destroyed houses, schools, private residences and public buildings. In Madagascar, a local quarry demonstrated the suitability of cobblestones for use in the construction of rural roads, inspired by examples in Ethiopia and Zambia. Many roads are left unpaved in remote areas due to the cost of imported asphalt. Paving roads with local cobblestones can improve food security in the wet season by ensuring that roads stay open while also being a major source of youth employment. These are just a few of the development possibilities that can come from rethinking the relationship between minerals, livelihoods and poverty reduction and reclaiming a mineral development agenda that prioritises local and domestic needs. Interest in the agenda is growing. New legislation, policies and development programming have been implemented and programs like the ACP EU Development Minerals Program have demonstrated the enthusiasm and potential of the sector. Given the scale of the challenge and the historical neglect, more interest, resources, research and action are needed. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. If you'd like to read more about this agenda, I encourage you to read one of my articles published on the topic. If you have any questions or ideas, please feel free to reach out. I look forward to connecting with you in the future.